Thank you for being in worship this morning. I, I greet you, those of you who are in person here, of course, but also those that are online. We always are glad when we have folks that worship with us online. And then I hear stories later about how God has used the message in some way or the worship experience to, to encourage you, and we're delighted to welcome you today as well. And for those of us in the room, doesn't this look nice? All that scaffolding gone, man, I, we're, we're ready to get something done here. And I am so glad. Thank you for being here. You may have heard about Brooklyn Tabernacle. Y'all know Brooklyn Tabernacle? The Brooklyn Tabernacle Choir, I'm, I'm confident some of you are familiar with that because they have some fantastic music. Boy, I, I love Brooklyn Tab. I, I really do. But did you know that that church is also known not for its music, just for its music, but for its prayer? That is a praying church. As a matter of fact, Jim Cimbala the pastor of that church, said that he credits the church, the, the prayers of the church for the impact of the church. In a book that you may not be familiar with, The Life That God Blesses, he says, a heart that prays and a church that gives itself to communion to the Lord, these are two of the great secrets that bring God's blessings in untold ways upon the earth. He also goes on to say, every Tuesday night at Brooklyn Tabernacle, we conduct the most important service of the entire week, our prayer meeting. I've never been. I've wanted to go. My kids have been, and they tell me it is unbelievable that you have to get there an hour or two hours early just to be able to get into the room, but it is a fantastic, dynamic experience of, a, of God being in that place, and God answers prayers. They have they pray for people there, and they see God do significant things in the life. What we find is that their secret is prayer. My hope and prayer is that our church, that all churches really, would become churches of prayer, mighty churches of prayer. And so today I'm talking about ch powerful church praying. The fact of the matter is that a powerful church must put a priority on prayer. Over the last several weeks, we've been learning about prayer. We've learned that Jesus says, my house shall be called a house of prayer. We also have learned that the disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray. And so he began to teach them how to communicate with the Father. And it's not with a lot of words, but it is that genuine, sincere heart of fellowship with God. It's a personal thing. It's kind of like when you get a card. You know, you get these cards in the mail on your birthday, your anniversary, or some other time, and, and, and then what do you read? Do you read the printed part of the card first, or do you read the handwritten part first? I read the handwritten part first. The personal part of it is what's more important. Now, I love the messages, but it's that personal note, and God's the same way. He wants to hear from all of us personally, and He works in our lives. Jesus also taught the disciples about the concert of prayer. What I mean is, he says, where two agree and ask in my name, it'll be given. That's coming together. The word that's used there, agree, has, is the word from which we get our symphony. That we come together, and, and collectively, Jesus taught us that we're to pray as a group as well. In the early church, they prayed as a group, and God moved in powerful ways. I want us to look today at some occasions when that early church prayed. And I want you to open your Bible. We're going to read for, from Acts chapter 4, but then we're going to be looking at chapter 1 and also at chapter 12. And so you can put your fingers on those places if you want to, and we'll get there in just a moment. But here in chapter 4, one of the great passages that, about prayer and the, uh, and the phenomenal response of God. Look at what it says in Acts chapter 4, verse 23. On their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. Why do the nations rage and the people plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers gather together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Indeed, 
Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. Verse 29, Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand and to heal and perform the miraculous signs and wonders through the name of your, your holy servant, Jesus. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. Now, we're going to come to look at this scripture in just a moment, but I want to go back to chapter 1. And this is the first time that we read about the church coming together in and, and prayer. And in chapter 1, Jesus had told them in verses five, 4 and 5 of, of Acts chapter 1, he says, I want you to wait. He says in verse 4, gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised, which he said, you heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many, many days from now. Now, Jesus told them, I want you to wait. In, in the book of uh, in, in Luke, the tr- chapter 24, he had told them, I want you to tarry and wait in Jerusalem until you're endued with power. And so here he tells them, you're going you're gonna to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And in verse 12, they go back to the upper room. And in verse 14 in chapter 1, we read this. They all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, with his brothers. They were constantly in prayer. What were they praying for? I, I, I think we can, without any hesitation, say they were praying for what Jesus had promised. They were asking... Lord, we don't know how you're going to do this, but we want whatever it is you're going to do. And so they were praying to be endued with power because that's what Jesus had promised them in Luke. And they were praying for what Jesus says here. You're going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So I'm convinced they're praying, Lord, send your spirit. Lord, send your power because we need your help. And they were praying for the Spirit to come and the power to come so that they could have direction in their life. They needed guidance. They had some decisions that they had to make. They had a candidate. They had to replace Judas. And, and so they, they got two candidates that are equally qualified. So how do you decide? Look at what it says here in verse 24, chapter 1. Then they prayed, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which of these two you have chosen. And so they needed direction, and they asked God as a body to give them direction, and the uh, lot fell upon Matthias, and he became the replacement. So God gave them the direction they needed. They needed power, and so they prayed. It's interesting to look and see here that chapter 2 is what we refer to as Pentecost. They prayed constantly. They were asking for the Holy Spirit. Did the Holy Spirit come in response to their prayers? Absolutely. In, in a way beyond anything they could imagine. Because of what it says is that a roaring wind filled the place. And the tongues of fire came upon them. And they began to speak in languages they had never heard of. The Holy Spirit came upon them. And he began to work through them. And the people were amazed. They said, what in the world is going on here? And Peter gives an explanation. And he preaches a little sermon. And guess what? The hearts of the people were convicted. And so they said, what shall we do? And Peter says in verse 38 of chapter 2, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sin, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And the Bible says that there were 3,000 people who came to know Christ as Lord and Savior that day and gave their heart to, lie, uh, to the Lord. They needed power. They needed direction. They said, Lord, we're praying and asking, and God gave it. You know, I think our needs today are a whole lot similar to theirs. As I think about it, for example, I think we need direction. Have you ever been in a situation where you were trying to decide what to do and really didn't know? That's when you have to ask God. It may be that you wondering about whether or not to make a change in your job. It may be whether you, you may be an employer and you're trying to decide which person is the right one for your company. It may be you're trying to decide, okay, who am I supposed to go out with? 
I mean, you're, you're trying to discern, determine that. I, I, what do you do? You ask God, believing that God is going to answer your prayers. I am convinced today that what we need in the, for an individual is also uh, good for the church, and we need God's direction. In the midst of this situation that we're in nationally, internationally, globally with COVID, we, as a church here, we need to know, God, what do you want us to do? How do we go about reopening? Lord, how do we begin to start these new, uh, bringing back our classes and getting our people back together and doing it in a way that's safe and, and that people can feel comfortable? We need divine direction. The leadership of our church needs divine direction. I hope you'll be praying for us. That's one area. I think of another and that is, well, as we're seeking God's men, can you imagine what it's like to be on a search committee and trying to decide, okay, God, what person do you have in mind to lead this fellowship for the years ahead? That's an awesome responsibility. We need to pray for that search committee, and they have to pray. They have to stay on their knees asking God, show us, Lord, we've got some wonderful candidates here. And I'm going to tell you, there are a lot of great preachers. There are a lot of great pastors in the state of Mississippi and outside the state of Mississippi. Most of the best ones in Mississippi. But uh, you know, the whole point I'm making here is that, that we have to make a decision about this. And so we need to pray for direction, and, and that's the case. Not only that, right now, we're in a, in a position as a church, we're in the process of selecting deacons. Deacon nominations are going on. And then we've got to decide, okay, which of these men are the right ones to be the servant leaders here at our church? That's an awesome decision. We constantly need to be asking God, Lord, you show us. Are you listening? I want you to hear this. It's not who we want, it's who God wants. That's the person that we need to lead this church as a pastor. That's the person we need or the persons we need to lead us as deacons. We want God's people to be in those places of leadership. But we also need the power of God. We, we need the Holy Spirit to work in us. You know, it's not by might and power. Isn't that what uh, God told Zechariah? He says in Zechariah 4, 6, So he said to me, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. You do realize that it is the Holy Spirit who gives the gifts to the church. And it is the Holy Spirit who not only gives the gifts to each individual, it's the Holy Spirit who guides in the use of those gifts. What I'm trying to help you understand is we are completely dependent upon the power and the work of the Holy Spirit in our life to be able to do the work that God has given us as a body, as a church in our community. The Holy Spirit is the one that we, we, we have to seek. What I'm, what I'm saying is as you prepare to come to worship each Sunday, when you, when you are making your way here, pray God fall fresh on us today. We need a, a, a fresh outpouring of God's Spirit. Pray, Lord, do your work of grace in my life, in our life today. Pray, draw us all closer to you. Draw me closer to you. That's what we need, and only God's power and Spirit can do that for us. Now, there are two requirements. As we're gonna, if we're going to pray this way, there are two, two requirements. Number one is obedience. If we're going to ask God to do this, then we're going to have to be obedient. God will only give His Spirit, pour out His Spirit, on those who are obedient. In the Old Testament, Saul, the king, the first king of Israel, you remember that he was given an assignment. He was to wipe out the Amalekites, but he didn't do it. He, 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 he saved the best, the people. He tried to blame the people. But the whole point is, he said that he had obeyed. But Samuel confronted him and says, no, you partially obeyed, and partial obedience is disobedience. So I'm simply saying to you, we need to search our hearts. Michael prayed that earlier. We need to search our hearts and really know whether or not we are being completely open with God and honest with God if we're going to ask God to pour out His Spirit upon us in a powerful and mighty way. Not only that, but I'm reminded that the strongest man that ever lived, the mightiest man from physical strength was Samson. I don't think he looked a whole lot different from other people, but he had supernatural strength because God had dedicated him as a Nazarite. When he violated his vows as a Nazarite, he lost his strength. And I'm simply saying to you, we cannot have impure lives. We cannot live by the world's standards and expect God to pour his spirit into us and to work through us the way we need. So we need God. Obedience is one of the requirements. The second requirement is you got to ask. You got to pray. 
I mean, the Bible tells us clearly. Listen to what Jesus says in Luke eleven thirteen. If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? We have to ask him. As you prepared to come in here today, did you pray, God, let your spirit fill that room. And Lord, let your spirit fill my heart. Or if you're at home, Lord, let your spirit fill where I am and fill my heart. Let me be sensitive and responsive to your leadership in my life. If you didn't, maybe one of the reasons you're not experiencing it is because the Bible says you have not because you ask not. So we need to ask, God, we need you. And that's the truth. As individuals, but as a body of Christ, we need God in the same way. Now let's look at chapter 4, the scripture I read earlier. I, I love this chapter. I, just, uh, I love the whole experience of it. You know it begins in chapter 3 where Peter and John are going to the temple to pray. They see this lame man, been lame since his birth, and uh, he looks to them and, and uh, they say, we don't have any money, but what we've got we'll give to you. And they say, rise up and walk. And the guy got up and walked. And everybody was amazed, created such a commotion that the Sanhedrin heard about it, and they brought them, Peter and John, before the Sanhedrin. They couldn't deny the miracle. And so what they did was they said, don't speak anymore in this name. You're creating chaos, you're confusion. We don't want you to preach anymore. And I love Peter's response in verse 19. But Peter and John replied, which is right in God's eyes, to listen to you or to him? You be the judges. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. And then they go back to the church, and they report to the church what has happened. And here in verse 23, they make the report. And in verse 24, notice what it says here, that they lifted up their voices in prayer. The church began to pray. And as they prayed, God began to move. He says to them, uh, they prayed in verse 29, Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. The Jewish leaders, the Sanhedrin, had, had put the pressure on. But when they put the pressure on, the church went to God. They turned up the intensity of prayer. And they are making fervent prayer for, for these men. They didn't pray for God to take away the problems. They didn't pray for God to deliver them out of the, 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 or change the situation or remove the threats. What they prayed was, Lord, give us boldness. Give us confidence and boldness to continue in spite of what these people are saying. Help us to be able to stand up for you. So they prayed for courage and for boldness to be a bold witness for God, and they prayed for God to give them that faith and that confidence. You know, I'm reminded Jesus did something similar. He prayed, Lord, I, in John 17, don't take them out of the world, but keep them in the world. Hold on to them, maintain them, enable them, and empower them, and strengthen them. I'm afraid that a lot of times in my situation, I, or situations I've gotten into, I've said, Lord, please take this situation away. Lord, take, uh, take the pressure off. I, I mean, I don't want to do this. But really what they prayed was, Lord, let us burn brightly for you in the midst of the darkness in which you have put us. And I think that is the way we need to be praying. Got to thinking about this, and I thought, you know, the world can try to shut us up. The world can try to uh, shut us down. The world can try to shut us out. But if we keep our eyes on Jesus and ask the Holy Spirit to empower us, then we can overcome whatever the world may throw at us. And so here's the situation. I think, again, as a church, there are some things that we need to be praying for. Right now... I hope that you are continuing to pray for our schools and our school children. I, I watch the news, and I'm, uh, I'm, I'm aware that there are sitting certain hot pockets where uh, the COVID is uh, impacting some schools. But we need to pray that God will minimize that, that he will hold that down, and let those children get their education. Let them, the teachers be confident and, and, and work together. We need to pray for God somehow or another to orchestrate all of this so that he ultimately gets the glory. But they are successful in what they're doing. But, you know, as our kids go to school, I think there's danger in COVID, but I think there's also a danger in temptations itself. I, I think about when I was a kid, 
and the temptations our youngsters are under today is so much greater than anything I faced. I mean, I didn't have to face drugs. We didn't have drugs when I was a kid. I mean, there was alcohol, but there weren't any drugs. We, we didn't have a lot of this. Other, we didn't have a culture that is, uh, you know, so far away from God as it is today. We didn't have all that. So we need to pray for our kids to be able to overcome the temptations. And if they fall, if they fail and make a bad choice, then we need to pray for them to have the, the grace and to repent, that they would have the wisdom to repent and come back to God and let God forgive them for it. I'm simply saying to you, we need to pray for our youngsters and pray for those in school. We need to pray for our teachers. I mean, this, uh, I can't even imagine. We need to pray for our police officers for sure. But I'm talking about our teachers have an awesome responsibility in the classroom. There's so many limitations and so many requirements and so many uh, different things that you have to contend with today in the teaching field. And, and, and I'm just amazed by that. You know, when I was a kid, we didn't have any problem praying in school. We didn't have any problem doing a lot of other things. But today, you got to be, I mean, it's very difficult, isn't it? I heard about this one teacher who was very creative. Came Christmas time, and so, you know, you, you got to be careful about saying anything. Christian-wise in schools, and so she, she was very careful. So they, they said, well, we're going to sing Christmas songs, and so they did. They sang about Rudolph, and they sang about Jingle Bells. They sang about Frosty, and then one of the little kids said, can we sing Away in a Manger? And so they sang Away in the Manger, and the teacher said, what is that song all about? And so they were able to talk about the birth of Christ, and so then they wanted to sing Silent Night. And so they sang Silent Night. And she said, what's that song all about? She was able to share a witness without the kids ask. And, and so I'm just telling you, we need to pray for our teachers to have sensitivity and to be open and find ways to stand up for Christ in their own personal life, but then when it's appropriate, to be able to share with others. I think another thing we need to be praying about right now in a powerful way is the election. I mean to tell you, folks, we are at a pivotal point in history in our country, and we need to pray for this election. We need to pray for the candidates, not simply for the president, but for all the others as well. We need to pray. Now, here's what I'm going to tell you. I'm not going to tell you how to vote, but I'm going to tell you, you better pray and you better vote. Seek God's face. Let God show you who you need to pray for genuinely ask, God, which of these candidates is going to enable this nation to continue to prosper and go forward and be the light that you want it to be? You pray and ask God to show you. And then when God shows you, you vote for that candidate. But by all means, pray and vote. And so we need to continue to pray. A little bit concerned. I know some folks that have drifted away from God. Do you know folks that have drifted away from God? I have some friends that have drifted away from God. And I'm thinking this morning that one of the burdens of my heart is, Lord, I'm praying for them. And I do. I pray for them. If you know someone that has gotten out over there and maybe too, getting close, too, too close to the world, maybe we used to call it skating on thin ice, in danger of falling, pray for them. You may not be able to do it. In fact, you can't. You can't change them. But you can let your understanding be known. But then we need to pray for God's will to be done in that situation. And so here's, this, here's what we're talking about. We're talking about as a church, praying for people. And we need to pray for those who are believers, but they have drifted away from the church. And through this COVID thing, I'm, I'm convinced that there are a lot of folks that, you know, are, may not come back to church, at least it's going to be difficult for some of them to come back because they've gotten so used. I had a guy tell me this week, he said, I'm going to tell you, he said, we enjoy watching uh, on, on the uh, uh, TV, the worship on TV, and uh, sitting there drinking coffee and sitting in my, in my pajamas. Well, I, I, I get that. But the other side of it, there's something about the corporate experience of worship. And you and I know that as we are here sharing it today. And God intended for the body to be together. And I think it's going to be very difficult for us to have the kind of impact that God wants unless we do spend time together with each other. And we're going to provide an opportunity for you to spend some time in prayer in a few weeks. Actually, September the 20th. We're going to that Sunday afternoon, 5 o'clock to 6. We're inviting the body to come together in prayer. 
I had a burden on my heart about it. I asked uh, Tom about it. Can we put this together? And so we're working to put it together. From 5 to 6, we're going we're to come into the presence of God. We're going to acknowledge the presence of God. We're going to invite God to move in a powerful way. We're going to worship and adore Him. And then we're going to genuinely get on our face before God and pray for certain things. I hope you'll be a part of that because it can be, and I believe God will use it to be a powerful experience of worship and, uh, and prayer. Well, the other passage that I want us to look at is found in chapter 12. And when you go to chapter 12, what you'll find is that this is the story of where Peter was arrested. Now, he was arrested because Herod put James to death, and it made the Jews happy. So he arrested Peter and had the intention of putting Peter to death as well. James, the brother of John, is the one he put to death. And, and so he's in prison. And not only that, but he had 16 guards, four shifts of four. And, and they're, they're, he's chained to them. They're in prison. I mean, Peter doesn't stand a chance. But what we find in verse 5 of chapter 12, so Peter was kept in prison, but look at this. Prayer for him was being made fervently by the church of God. But prayer was being made fervently by the church to God. Now, what happened when that church prayed fervently? Well, what happened was an angel showed up in that jail cell, and he hits Peter in the side and says, wake up, we're getting out of here. And Peter thinks it's a dream. The shackles fall off. The door opens. They go out past the first guard. They go out past the second guard, and it's not until he gets out in the street that he realizes this is real. This is really happening. And so he goes to Mary's house, knocks on the door, where the church is praying, by the way. And you remember the story. Rhoda comes to the door, and uh, Peter says, I, I'm Peter. Let me in. And, and she, she, she couldn't believe it. And so she goes running back and tells the people, Peter's at the door. They said, no, he ain't. He's in jail. And so then they go to the door, and sure enough, it's Peter. Several things come out of that story that I, I love. Number one is they were praying, and God answered their prayers. Number two is when God answered the prayer, they didn't believe it. Isn't it amazing? I mean, how many times do we pray for something, and then we really doubt whether or not God's going to do it? That's the reason Jesus said, when you're praying, Matthew 22, 21, I believe it is, or 21, 22, one or the other. And he said, when you're praying, believe, and you will receive what you're asking for. Friends, we've got to believe. Does God answer prayer? Absolutely. We have been walking through a sojourn with Joel and Emily about their son Samuel, and it's going to culminate when God answers a prayer in dark distress, but God answers a prayer, and God is wanting to answer our prayer. God wants to answer your prayers more than you want to pray. And so what we have to do is we have to come to God and ask Him to work in our life. A couple of years ago, I went to the Southern Baptist Convention in uh, Birmingham, and I heard Andrew Brunson, a pastor that was in prison in Turkey for a couple of years, and uh, he was released. And he talked about, you know, how he'd gotten a lot of help from, uh, from President Trump, but what he said was his release was effected not through the political realm only, but rather it was through the prayers of God's people. God heard the prayers of his people, and he enabled Pastor Brunson to get out. And I am so grateful that he did. My whole point here is God is still in the prayer answering business. Let's believe it, and let's claim it, and let's go forward with it. We need to pray for missionaries around the world. This is kind of personal to me for sure because I've got a granddaughter and her husband and a little great-grandson who will be in the Middle East before long, and we're going to be praying for them. I've already been praying for them. But pray for those folks that they'll have open doors, that they'll be bold like the Scripture says here, but that God will open the doors. And if they get in prison, that God will work to release them as well. You know, Jesus came and he said, I've come to set the captives free. In the very first sermon that he preached in, in, the, uh, in the synagogue, he says, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom to the captives, and release from darkness to the prisoners. Now, I don't know a place where Jesus 
got anybody out of jail. But I, I can read multiple stories of how Jesus released people in bondage. Those people that were possessed by demons and Jesus set them free, he cast them out. Jesus came to those people that were ill, those that were blind, those that were lame, and he released them and helped them to be free. And Jesus is still in that same business today. He is working to set free those who are in bondage. He's the great emancipator, and he wants to work in our lives today. You may know of someone who is in a prison of their own making. It may be because of some a kind of, of, of drug addiction. It may be gambling. It may be alcohol. It may be pornography. Whatever it is, here's what I want you to know and what you need to claim and pray for. Jesus can release them. Jesus can set them free. And we need to pray for those folks. And I think it will help when we do it together as a body. And so here's what I want to do. I want us to spend a few minutes here now, just a, a little time in prayer this morning, right right where we are here. People online, we can invite you to join in and, and uh, in your place, wherever you are, uh, to pray. But here, I'm going to ask you to get, in a, get, get comfortable in a posture of prayer, and then I'm going to kind of lead us through several things that I want us to do as we, as we pray, okay? So let's, let's, uh, let's, let's get in this position. And the first thing that you need to do is, <clears throat> and next Sunday I'll be talking about approaching God in prayer, looking at the model of prayer. But the first thing that you have to do is you have to make connection with God. So here's what I want you to do right now. Just, just make connection with the Father. He is a loving, loving, heavenly Father. And He wants to bless your life. Reach out to Him. Focus on Him. Worship Him. Express your adoration and your thanksgiving for all that He's done in your life. Ask God to draw near to you now as you draw near to Him. Pray that the Holy Spirit would fill this place, fill the place where you are, fill your heart. Ask God for direction in your life. I'm not sure where you are. I know all of us have to make decisions, and we're constantly in a process of doing that. Why don't you right now just say, God, you know what I need. Please help me to do the thing that would please you most. Ask God to show you and guide you in it. As a church, we're, 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 we're trying to make decisions. I mentioned them earlier. Just ask God right now, Lord, be with our search committee. Give them holy wisdom. And Lord, be with the candidates that they're talking to. Those men need to know that you're talking to them and you're drawing them. So we need to pray. Pray, God, lead our committee to find your man for our church. And then pray, Lord, as we go through this deacon selection process, let the men that you want to serve as deacons to be ministers in this church, Lord, let them be elected. Put it on their heart to serve. You know, that's one thing. A lot of times guys don't want to serve. They're afraid of it for a lot of reasons. I, don't, I won't go into all that. But we need to, Lord, give, give them a heart. Give them a desire. And let the right ones be selected. Maybe you, like me, have a concern about someone who's drifted away from God. Can we just take time right now and as a body pray, Lord, show them. Lord, the enemy is a deceiver. He's a liar. And he's blinded the minds of people. Lord, would you open their eyes to what reality is and what they're doing to themselves? And Lord, if, they, if these people do not know Christ, let's pray, God, open, their, open the eyes of their heart to see that Jesus is the Savior and that he is willing to receive them if they will come to him and pray that they will come to Christ. Maybe that somebody you know that drifted away from the church and we just need to pray, Lord, draw them back. Maybe that you're someone that you need to pray right now who's addicted. Could be drugs. My, I deal with this so oftentimes in the more ministry that I, I, I'm a part of. And it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, an enemy that takes hold of them. I've got extended family dealing with the addiction. And I'm praying, God, draw them back to you. They know you. 
let them overcome this addiction and begin to live. They've got to, they've got to begin to live in a positive way for the Lord. So pray the Lord to set them free from their bondage. Father, we're so grateful that you have opened the door for us to pray and that when we come, we come to the God of all the universe. Lord, we're not talking to some kind of super authoritative person. We're talking to God who created us, who created this world, who controls everything. And Lord, we know that you have a perfect will. And so, Lord, we want to be in tune with you. And so right now, Father, hear our prayers. And as you moved in that early church, Lord, that place where they were was shaken. And with boldness, they gave witness. Lord, fill us with that boldness and help us to be the witnesses you want us to be. So, Father, thank you for this time to look at your word, to look at these other churches or this church and the instances where they prayed. Now, Father, would you help us to become a powerful church in prayer? God, let each one of us commit ourselves to that reality. And we trust you to do it in Jesus' name. Amen.